Trade-offs. Life is all about balance. Whether it's deciding between a PlayStation or an Xbox, or choosing to stay home to eat, rather than going to a restaurant. But the choices that I find myself thinking about most frequently stem from programming. I'm building a voxel game engine of massive scale, and this month I implemented two new features, collision detection and transparency, both of which involved making a key choice to best fit my vision for the future of the engine. I would love to share the both of them with you, so let's dive right in. Last month was a busy month for me, but I did manage to find some time to work on the voxel game engine. The first thing that I did was get a head start on the physics system. Physics is something that I've really dreamed of since the beginning of my engine. Normally, in a 3D game, you have 3D meshes made up of flat 2D triangles, like they're made of paper mache, and this makes doing collision detection kind of hard. Typically, you approximate the shape of an object with a box collider or a capsule collider. But with voxels, you've got an easy, intuitive representation of the underlying volumetric data. And to me, this fact made it feel as though there should be an easy and efficient means of doing collision detection and other physics on voxel objects. So I dived right in and started work on the collision detection system, which is the core of any physics engine. The collision detection system tells the game when objects are overlapping so that the game can decide how to move objects apart and whether objects should slide or whether they should bounce. And at this point, I was faced with a key trade-off. I could either choose to use an existing physics library like NVIDIA's PhysX, or I could choose to build my own collision detection mechanism from scratch. Now, the pre-built library option does have some attractive benefits. I would get a variety of collision detection routines out of the box. I could detect cubes intersecting with spheres, spheres intersecting with capsules, all sorts of good things. But on the other hand, a generalized system would be harder to specialize and fit into my application. Whereas if I wrote a custom collision detection routine specific for voxel octrees versus other boxes and voxel octrees, I would be able to specialize it and optimize it just for my application and my use case. I chose to go with the second option because I thought, I theorized, that I could make the collision detection routines very efficient for voxels on voxels, and I am pleased to report that I have done so. I chose to use a collision detection technique known as the separating axes theorem. The separating axes theorem is fairly ubiquitous in game engine development, so I won't go over the theory in too much detail here. But the basic idea is that two objects aren't overlapping if you can draw a plane between them, and two objects must be overlapping if there's no plane that you can draw between them, and they're convex. Cubes are convex, so we're in luck. And the key realization that makes this seemingly simple fact useful for physics engines and games is that there are only a finite number of these separating planes that you need to check in order to get collision detection working. For example, regarding squares and rectangles, you only need to check the planes that are parallel to the faces of the objects. In 3D, with 3D cubes, things get a little bit more complicated. There are actually 15 separating planes you have to use because of very literal corner cases and edge cases, but by and large, the concept is exactly the same. And the cool thing about the separating axes theorem is that you can actually use it to detect when objects will collide, not just whether two objects have collided. And the way you do this is by essentially projecting your objects onto what's known as a separating axis, an axis that is perpendicular 
to the separating plane. And when you project your objects onto this axis, you get little shadows which show you the minimum and maximum displacements of the object from the collision plane. And if you look at the little gap in the center there, that tells you how far the objects would need to move to potentially overlap. If they're already overlapping like that on all possible separating axes, then you know your objects are colliding. So you can use this information to actually predict when an object with a certain velocity will collide. And this enables me to do something called continuous collision detection, where I predict in advance when shapes are going to hit each other, which prevents objects clipping through walls or tunneling where they phase through one another, something that's always bothered me in other games. Now, under the hood, engines like PhysX might also use the separating axes test. But I'm quite pleased with the optimizations that I was able to make to the algorithm specific for voxel octrees. There's one really neat mathematical thing about voxels, which is that they're all grid aligned on a regular 3D grid. And what's neat about this is if I choose one voxel in a grid, take this one, and I want to transform it somehow so it becomes this other voxel over here, all I need to do is shift this first voxel by some amount in 3D space and also scale it by some amount. This is mathematically called linearity. And the interesting thing here is that it extends to the separating axes tests used in game collision detection. So if I take a voxel and I scale it by some amount, or I shift it in some direction, that scale and shift proportionally happens to the object's projection, the object's little shadow, on the separating axes that we're currently examining. And what this means is that I was able to drastically reduce the number of calculations utilized in my separating axes tests. What I did during my collision detection algorithm was compute the separating axes projections, compute these little shadows that you need for collision detection for a single voxel centered at the origin, and then reused those same intervals, those same shadows, for every single voxel versus voxel collision detection that I did in my scene. So if I needed to test these two voxels over here, I would simply linearly scale and shift the separating axis intervals so that they aligned with the new voxels that I was testing. And this means that I was able to cut down the number of matrix multiplications that I had to do per, per voxel versus voxel collision detection and I was actually able to get that down to just one or two matrix multiplies per voxel on voxel collision detection test, which is really quite nice. I'm super happy with it. Another thing that I was able to take advantage of was the fact that I store my voxels as voxel octrees. So big empty areas of space are represented as just one sparse node. And when I have one big empty area of space, I know that I can immediately skip collision detection between that area of the object and any other voxel objects because there's no voxels there. So the voxel octree structure makes it extremely easy to figure out which portions of an object might intersect with something else. I'll definitely talk about this more in the next episode as I continue to develop my physics engine. Having finished the collision detection routine for my game engine, I wanted to work on something a little bit different, so I turned to transparency. Transparent objects are one of those things without which I think a game feels half-baked. Even if a game does not use transparency extensively, if you think of Minecraft, most blocks are not transparent. The game just feels incomplete without them, because you imagine Minecraft without transparency. You can't have windows, you can't have doors. So I've known for a long time as well that I want to support transparent voxels in my game. Unfortunately, transparency in video games is really hard to get right because transparency is not order independent. That is to say, if you have two pieces of stained glass, one red 
and one green, and you put the red stained glass in front of the green, you'll expect to see a color that's more red, whereas if you swap the two with the green in front, you'll expect to see a color that's more green. This is problematic for modern rendering with GPU rasterization, because GPUs just draw triangles on the screen by filling in pixels, one at a time. So the order in which you draw those triangles matters for transparency. And this is a very difficult issue to get around. To have perfectly accurate results, you need to sort your scene on a per pixel basis, which is too expensive for most hardware. To get around this, many games resort to sorting things on a triangle level. I believe Minecraft does this. It sorts all of the triangles in the scene that are transparent back to front. And this is enough in most cases, although it can still technically break in certain instances. But it's quite computationally expensive, even taking into account some of the tricks you can do when all of your objects are grid aligned. I was concerned about the performance implications of using sorting to achieve transparency. So at this point, I faced another trade-off. There's a second way to do transparency called weighted order independent blending that allows you to draw your scenes without sorting the triangles. It comes at a cost though, which is that sometimes the colors may not exactly match the physically correct version of the scene. I chose to go with order independent transparency because my scenes potentially can have a lot of complex objects with many triangles, with concavities, and sorting would just be computationally expensive. I'm glad that I did because in the end I was able to achieve an effect that looks so similar to ordered transparency that honestly, if you asked me which it was, I couldn't tell you whether it was sorted or order independent. And the way this works is you take all of your transparent objects and you average their colors based upon their alpha factor, their transparency level. And this gives you something that doesn't change depending upon the object order. And then you take this output and you blend it normally into the rest of the scene. The result is something that looks very close to actual transparency and you can achieve this just with one extra render pass, just a little bit of extra computation. But in certain cases where you have multiple objects overlapping, the colors may not exactly match what they should be. The result was so close though, that I think this was the right decision in my case, and using order independent transparency will also allow me to add additional things like transparent water with relative ease. For my case, order independent transparency over sorting the triangles was definitely the correct trade-off to make. So. I have more to add to the physics engine, like object-on-object -object collisions and rotation, and thus I'd best get back to it. I also have some code cleanup to do related to transparency. But before I go, I'd like to offer you, the viewer, a trade-off. You can subscribe to my channel and get the latest updates, the other option being not to subscribe, which, well, it would make me very sad. So. I encourage you to like the video and subscribe if you enjoyed things, and thank you very much for watching. Have a lovely day.